Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Helping Victims of Identity Theft and Consumer Fraud Crimes. I'm Ariel Altman from the Civil Division of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. All of us at NLADA are thrilled to be joined today by experts from the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection to present on how you can use FTC resources to report fraud and help your clients recover from identity theft. They will also discuss some of the most troubling frauds that we're seeing affecting low-income clients and what you can do to help report those scams to civil and criminal law enforcement. In addition to helping you better serve your clients, these resources can also be extremely valuable to programs considering grant funding for projects that help victims of crime. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers from the FTC. Monica Vaca and Amy Jekon. Monica is the Associate Director for the Division of Consumer Responses and Operations at the FTC, where she oversees the Consumer Sentinel Network, a law enforcement database of consumer reports about scams in the marketplace. As a 15-year veteran of the FTC, Ms. Vaca has a wide breadth of law enforcement experience in fraud cases. Amy is the program manager for the Do Not Call Registry at the FTC, working on Do Not Call as well as the Consumer Sentinel Network. Ms. Jackon has been at the FTC for 13 years, working with consumers and law enforcement on various consumer protection issues. Before we dive into the presentation, I have a few logistical matters to share. First, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So please submit your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and our speakers will respond to as many questions as they can at the end. If you're interested in accessing the presentation slides, we'll be posting them on the webinar page of the NLADA website tomorrow. And finally, we'll be recording this webinar and plan on posting it to the NLADA website in the next couple of weeks. Thank you again to our speakers and to all of our participants joining today. And now I'm going to pass it over to Monica. Hello, um, good afternoon everyone and thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, big thanks to NLADA for hosting this webinar. Uh, today I'm joined by my colleague, Amy Chakan, who will um, be speaking in just a few minutes. Um, but first I want to just give you um, a little bit of the lay of the land for why we are here uh, doing this webinar. Um, so, um, the reason for this webinar is to make you aware of how you can incorporate already existing and free FTC resources to help you assist your clients who are victims of identity theft and consumer fraud. So just as a backdrop, <clears throat> excuse me, just as a backdrop, um, I'm a former legal aid lawyer myself, um, and in my current role I participate for the FTC on the Department of Justice's Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. And in that role, I've come to learn about funding opportunities that may be available um, for offices that are addressing consumer fraud and identity theft issues. Um, so there's many types of funding out there, but as I read through the, re uh, the recent uh, VOCA solicitation, um, Victims of Crime Office solicitation, it became apparent to me um, that the hard work that we did at the Federal Trade Commission to put together identitytheft.gov into an easy uh, to access resources could be put to use in your work, helping your clients. Um, and we have other resources that we will discuss. So um, just as an overview, um, the slide that you're looking at right now um, is an overview of how we're going to move through this presentation. So first off, what we'd like to do today is to show you how to assess the needs in your state and your community and what resources the FTC has to help you do that. Then we're going to move on to uh, the next piece, which is how to meet the needs. Um, and the meat of this presentation is going to be identitytheft.gov, um, but there is more. And I'm just going to um, pause here for just a second to say, if it turns out that your office will be using identity theft or idtheft.gov in your work, I would love to know that. Um, my contact information is included, and um, you should feel free to reach out to me anytime. 
And then finally, we'll talk about how you can use the FTC tools to help develop metrics on the numbers of people that you've helped and perhaps more. So we're going to begin with the Consumer Sentinel Network. So um, the next, this slide is, helps us to see what is the need? You know, what are we talking about here? Um, and let me tell you what these statistics are and, you know, how you can use them. So we collect complaints here at the Federal Trade Commission um, into a database that we call the Consumer Sentinel Network. Um, this is a portal that consumers can use to file reports about their negative experiences in the marketplace, you know, their complaints. Um, and these reports are stored in Consumer Sentinel, which is a secure online database that law enforcement uh, users around the country can access. We have a lot of partners, better business bureaus, state attorney general's offices, private partners, others, who feed their complaints into Sentinel as well. And this gives us a picture of what's happening in the marketplaces that consumers experience. Um, and each year we publish data about this. Um, so what you're looking at here on this slide is um, uh, some really very, very broad uh, pieces of data about the kind of reports that we're getting from consumers. And you can see that the orange bar at the bottom represents the number of fraud complaints. Uh, the blue bar represents identity theft. Um, and the yellow bar represents other types of complaints about consumer issues. Those other types of complaints can include things like debt collection, where you're not necessarily talking about fraud, um, but, you know, um, sometimes you do have some, some, um, some fraud involved there, too. Um, but in any event, that is what you're looking at here. And these are the statistics that we keep on a yearly basis. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, I want to show you where you can find this information. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a dive into what this information looks like uh, for 2016 to give you an idea of what's there. But I want to show you here where you can access this. So we keep and we publish reports every single year. You can find the reports going back to 2000 on this website right here. Um, and um, it's going to be an important resource for you if you're trying to identify your need or explain what your need is or assess what your need is um, uh, locally um, as well as in your, in your state. So these are not just national statistics. But let's go to the next page so I can show you a little bit more about what's here. Okay, so what you're looking at here is um, the top 30 complaint categories for 2016. Um, so, you know, we've, we've categorized these into these various areas so that you can, uh, and the public generally, can see what's trending. I, I want to be clear about something. This is not a survey. So we haven't gone out and done like a, a telephonic survey of some sort or an online survey to find out what's affecting people. These are consumer reports to us or consumer reports to the Better Business Bureau or any one of our data contributors. This is self-reported statistics, okay? So it's not a survey. Um, but what you can see is that the number one problem that people reported to us in 2016 was debt collection. Number two, and this is the number, uh, this is a fraud category here, the number one fraud category is imposter scams. And number three is identity theft. Um, so if you go down that list, you can see um, which ones, um, uh, you know, all the various uh, uh, types of complaints that have been reported to us. Many of these will include conduct that can be criminal. When we talk about imposter scams, we are talking about frauds in which someone is posing as um, typically as a member of the government, for instance. It could be the IRS. It could be the FBI. So when we talk about consumer fraud, we are also frequently talking about criminal conduct. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so here's some other um, demographic data that we are able to capture in Consumer Sentinel, and that is something that is uh, published every year. Um, so not everybody reports to us their age. Um, and so we don't have 
age statistics for every single person who reports to us, only about one-third of the complaints that we get into Consumer Sentinel include some amount of age information. But here are some statistics about um, different age populations and how they are, what numbers that they are complaining to us in. Um, and you'll notice that um, our, our, our big reporters here are folks um, who are uh, in the 40 to 50 uh, age range. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. All right, so now let's say that you are looking to try to assess what needs are, 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 are in your community. Um, what we have here is a chart of the various states and where they rank in terms of the numbers of complaints that we receive. So again, I want to caution everybody. Having a high number of complaints doesn't mean that fraud is, is extra prevalent in that particular community. It can just mean that consumers are particularly good at reporting to us from those, from those communities. Um, but nevertheless, this is important for you to know because here are statistics about who is complaining to us from what states. If you look into our actual data book, and this is the slide I showed you a few minutes ago, um, uh, the links on our website, what you will see is a breakdown for each of these states, what are the top categories of fraud that people are reporting. So there is additional information for each state uh, including dollar amounts lost. Um, so please know that that is a resource for you to assess your needs. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we've got this also broken down by um, identity theft complaints. Um, and again, we have more information available in our data book um, about identity theft complaints. Um, let me just say one more thing about an, another demographic that we have in our data book and that is about um, consumers with any kind of military service or their families. Um, so that information is also broken down in our data book. If those are communities that you service, um, then you may really want to look through the data book to, um, to be able to uh, you know, assess the needs in your community. And finally, um, we've got all of this information broken down by state. We also have information broken down by metropolitan statistical area. Um, now, for those of you who are familiar with, you know, the census and how the census operates, a metropolitan statistical area is um, is basically a group. It's a group of uh, it could be cities and zip codes um, uh, that um, that are that that the census determines like sort of belong together as part of a community. Um, we have metropolitan statistical areas broken down in our, um, for identity theft and for fraud complaints. Um, and so if you want to look and see, you know, what's happening in the, um, in the Clearwater St. Pete area, what's happening in these various different communities, you can get pull those statistics from the data book as well uh, to uh, be able to look and see what your uh, community is complaining about or is reporting to the FTC. Okay, so next we're going to move on to the meat of this. Amy? Yes. Um, so we've talked a little bit about what some of the problems are, um, one of them being clearly identity theft. Um, and we have um, some tools and resources. I'm going to start with identitytheft.gov. This is, is intended sort of as a one-stop resource for people um, trying to report or recover from identity theft. And so I'm going to walk through how the tool works, um, what's available in it, um, and hopefully give you a sense of, of, of how you can use this resource um, to help um, clients and identity theft victims. Um, just to give a, just very briefly, um, a sense of where the FTC fits in this, um, we, we sort of have three prongs of, of our mission involved in this. Um, one is obviously we work with law enforcement we're, and we're a civil law enforcement agency ourselves. Um, we look to investigate in, um, in areas of deceptive and unfair business practices. And so that includes things like mortgage and um, debt relief scams, telemarketing fraud, online privacy, high-tech fraud, imposter scams. Um, it's pretty broad. Um, but we also work on consumer education, trying to create materials and resources to help consumers who are dealing with these issues. Um, and also we help um, business guidance in this area as well. 
Um, in, in 2014, the Department of Justice came out with, with a statistic that 17.6 million people were victims of identity theft, which is 7% of the population. That's a massive number of people who are affected by this. The FTC received nearly 400,000 complaints about it in 2016, making it the third most um, reported area, um, as we saw early in our statistics as well. Um, examples of how how identity theft, um, how an identity could be misused, opening a credit card account, opening utility accounts, applying for a tax refund, getting a loan, employment, medical care. Um, but the impact um, can be pretty pretty broad as well. Um, you can suddenly have bad credit, denial of loans um, for student or mortgage, denial of medical care or um, medical errors, a lawsuit, garnishment, tax problems. Um, this can have a direct financial loss, um, denial of employment or public housing, civil judgments. Um, and also it can just be embarrassing um, and cause, cause a feeling of helplessness. Um, and so, it can, it can affect things um, more broadly than just sort of the normal, what you think of as denial of credit. Um, and because of this, we've, we've created this resource. Um, identitytheft.gov helps people create personal recovery plans, step-by-step -step advice. It, it sort of is, the idea is no matter what kind of identity theft you've, you've uh, been a victim of, we're sort of gonna help you walk through what steps you should take to recover. Um, and I'll walk through how the resource does that. Um, it's, the idea is that you can report and recover from identity theft, report a problem, it will ask specific questions so that people know, we know exactly what's happened, so we know exactly what the next steps are. Here you see the home page. Um, the website was designed for usability. The idea is that it's supposed to, between language and infographics and colors, make it as, as easy and as user-friendly as possible. Um, you'll notice also in the upper right-hand corner, it's also available in Spanish for Spanish-speaking consumers so that we have as much accessibility as, as we're able to through the website. Um, the first step once you've gone in is, is a Get Started page. The idea is to answer, start answering some basic questions so we know what's happened to you, so again, we know what, what next steps would be, including related things related to identity theft, knowing that your information is exposed, even though you don't know if anything's happened yet, losing your wallet, things that make you sort of vulnerable to identity theft. And so the next, because we not acknowledge that each one of the situations can be unique, the questions are tailored to come up with exactly what's happened in your particular situation. So in, you know, was it something that's happened to your credit card account? Is it involved employment or taxes? And we sort of go through the questions one, one by one with, with people so we have an idea of what information we need. Um, for identity theft victims, the website is an information process. That's where we start um, to gather information. As you can see across the top of the website, we go through six screens to collect details about what happened. The website explains that the information is gonna be used to create an identity theft report and an individual recovery plan so they know why we're collecting the information along with what we're collecting. The website explains how people's information will be used um, and integrated into the Consumer Sentinel Network, um, which is our database of consumer fraud complaints. So next, I, I referenced the identity theft report. In many cases, to help recover from identity theft, consumers need an identity theft report. Um, it used to be that they needed to go to their police station and have something signed that's no longer considered um, necessary, although some creditors might, um, and so we kind of keep, make the form with that in mind. Um, it's very important. Um, um, to collect this information because it's the information we know creditors need. Um, we used to create an affidavit for law enforcement, and this is a very similar format, but it's, it's now not requiring that police signature. Um, and hopefully this will be the go-to thing that they need when they're reporting to all of their creditors, so we sort of create that all in one place. Um, one of the key sort of 
innovations that's come from this website is that it's not just you go in and you report the information, you can create a personal account. Because identity theft can be an ongoing um, process and recovering is an ongoing process, we create this account so that one person's information, they don't have to enter it again once something else has happened from it. Um, if there's an update, they find out some other account was compromised, et cetera, they don't have to pre refill out information, it's all already there. And it also that information will update their recovery plan and their identity theft report. So once they have an identity theft recovery plan, once they've entered all the information, the recovery plan comes up. And this is sort of an example I put in front of you. The simple personal recovery plan for someone who's reported, this is for somebody who's involving um, theft to their bank account. When you click each arrow, the site will accordion out and provide details about how to do each one of these steps. For example, the system advises, place a fraud alert on your credit report. When the person clicks that arrow, they'll get a link to the three credit bureaus. The system will explain that the fraud alert is free and will make it hard for someone to open a new account in their name. So it's not just here's what you should do, it's step by step, this is how you do it. It will also tell a person to keep an eye out to make certain they get a letter from each credit bureau confirming that this has actually happened. For each recovery step, the system is going to provide follow-ups and reminders. For example, the first step, call Bank of America. Well, here's a follow-up to the first step. The step will ask the person for the date that they called. 14 days later, it'll send a message asking if the person got a confirmation letter back from the bank. So it sort of stays with you as the process continues. If a person hasn't received a confirmation letter, the system will then prompt them to send a follow-up letter to Bank of America. And you can see in this step that the system has already created the follow-up letter. It pre-fills the information the person has already provided. And the, all the person has to do is review the letter, print the letter, and send it out. The system creates the letters for people to send to credit reporting agencies, debt collectors, merchants, and others involved in the identity theft. Here's an example of a follow-up letter to the lender where a fraudulent account was opened in the victim's name. You'll see in the upper right-hand corner, the letter has the identity theft.gov logo, showing that the person reported the identity theft to the FTC. And in the lower corner, the letter lists the enclosures the person will need to spend to speed the resolution of their claim. So this, again, is not just saying what you need to do it's helping you create the tools. It's telling you each step along the way. So it's not just um, a checklist. Um, here's an example of a specific recovery step to help consumers get fraudulent information removed from their credit report. So you'll see we've created the letter. And when did you when did you send the letter? Did you did the um, credit reporting agency? correct the report, and you can check off things as you go so you know what's happened and it helps you track all of this. And since we know all the steps, we can help pre-populate them so we know exactly what needs to happen and they can help track it. The system automatically creates pre-filled letters so that you can send them to credit, credit bureaus, businesses, and debt collectors. The letters just need to be printed, signed, and mailed. So this is as far as we can go on the website. They, they'll have to mail them, but we've created it for them with all the pieces of information they have, all the information that we have, um, so that they don't need to create it from step one. Um, one other thing that um, identity theft victims, when it involves a tax-related identity theft, um, the IRS needs a form 14039. Um, and this is the IRS identity theft affidavit, and we pre-fill it with all the information the consumer has supplied to us. And the consumer can then print it, complete anything that wasn't in their original report, and send it to the IRS to get the identity theft resolved. This is another sort of major step. And, you know, a, a big government form like this can be intimidating, and the fact that we sort of pre-populate it and take care of most of it for them um, can be a big help. So how do we envision using identitytheft.gov? Um, so uh, for legal aid providers, obviously you can refer identity theft victims to identitytheft.gov. We make it as user-friendly and accessible as possible. We try to make it as easy as possible. But also option two, if your client is someone who can't 
doesn't have internet access or for some other reason this wouldn't be an accessible process for them. Um, we hope that this is easy enough that you can help um, use it and help fill it out for a client. Um, certainly that, that's something we would encourage if that's helpful as well. We also have um, outreach, identity theft education and prevention materials and we have free materials in bulk order um, at bulkorder.ftc.gov. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, so you have a sense there um, then of what are what we have available on identitytheft.gov. Um, so I know that there are funding opportunities that are out there that want to make use um, of technology, uh, that want to make use of um, uh, you know innovative programs to um, meet the needs of rural consumers, for example. Um, and this is one that we think you can deploy successfully um, to help people who have had their identity stolen. I mean, these are um, people who are victims of crime uh, for sure. Um, so uh, what you're seeing up on the screen now is um, a brochure or it's a, it's a booklet actually that we have that is available to you if this is something that you want to have um, uh, in your offices, these are things that we can send to you. And this particular resource goes through uh, what identitytheft.gov uh, provides to you. And I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to toot our horn just a little bit here because um, when I say it's an innovative program, I really mean that. Um, this was, uh, this is a site that we developed just in 2016, launched just in 2016. And um, this year, it was uh, nominated to be a finalist of the uh, federal government SAMI Awards. Uh, so this is something that we think can be uh, can be used by you and all your offices. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit now about um, um, some other resources. Um, so we mentioned, you know, so I, I see identitytheft.gov as a very concrete way that you can help people who have been the victims of identity theft. You can put in their hands a letter. You can put in their hands a recovery plan. Um, there, that's very, very concrete assistance. In addition to that kind of assistance, we have available um, at the FTC a number of really terrific resources for consumers um, available in English and Spanish to help them um, avoid scams, uh, spot, recognize scams, avoid scams, and of course we would love to have those reported to the FTC. On this page here, you'll see sort of a smattering of them, and you'll see that we can focus, and, and there are so many more, but I'm just, I've just pulled out a few that you can take a look at. Um, one of them, of course, is about child identity theft, which you can see there. Um, and then over on the left side, you've got um, what we're calling our fotonovelas, which are um, small booklets that follow a narrative of a person who's experienced some kind of fraud. These are printed in Spanish. These are available for you to order for free. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, the other resource I want to point you to here is Pass It On. Pass It On is a campaign that the FTC developed for active older adults um, with the idea that um, they know a lot about, um, uh, about the world, about fraud, about scams, um, and by talking about it, they can help their family, they can help their neighbors, and they can also learn a thing or two about the scams that we're seeing that are prevalent right now. Um, so these are our Pass It On materials. And then finally, I'll just mention our immigration wallet cards, um, which provide information to immigrants about where to get help, immigration services help. Okay, so let's go to um, the next slide, if we could, Amy. Um, where do you get these really fabulous resources? Um, well, here you go, bulkorder.ftc.gov. This is available to any of you, uh, all of you and any of you, and you can order any of our materials in English or Spanish in bulk and for free. They will be shipped directly to your office. Um, so again, I want to say that again because every time I say this, people don't necessarily um, uh, believe it. It sounds too good to be true, but it's not. These resources are available to you for free and in bulk 
in English and Spanish. Um, you don't even pay shipping. So please use these resources. These were paid for by the taxpayers. We want to make sure that people are getting them and using them. Um, okay, the next slide. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Amy. So we talked a lot about tools for identity theft, um, and uh, identitytheft.gov has, has some very good resources, um, but we also deal with consumer fraud, um, and um, that is obviously broader than identity theft, and we do have some place for consumers to report this as well. Um, it's at um, complainassistant.gov, and this is sort of a little snapshot of the home page. Um, it also asks some basic questions to, to get an idea of what happened. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do screenshots of the whole walkthrough, but it's very similar in the style. It walks through, it asks you some basic questions. We don't ask that consumers um, give us any information more than they are willing to give. They can um, file anonymously. They can give us as little information as they feel comfortable doing. Um, also, just, just to give an idea, just like identity theft, if you want to file a complaint on behalf of a consumer, that is fine as well. There's a place where you can identify yourself as having um, filed on behalf of somebody. There's also another way that we can identify. I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but for somebody who has something they, that, that happened to them, particularly fraud, um, this is a great place to report that. And, um, and, and so th the question is, to what extent, what, what help can we offer if you have filed? Um, one, we do bring cases based on complaints that are filed um, in our complaint assistant. Um, we, don't, we don't intervene on individual cases, so I need to emphasize that. But we do, we do use these complaints to find, um, find sources of fraud, and so, so it is helpful in that way. When we do bring cases and we get money back for consumers, um, we do try in whatever cases is possible to get money back and return it to consumers. Um, and we find that if we have information in our complaint assistant or in our consumer assistant network from our complaint assistant complaints, those consumers are the most likely to get that money back because we have information um, for them. Um, and so there is, a like, there is a possibility that we can get money back in these. Um, and our... Our complaints that we get in are reported, um, our reports that we get from consumers are connected to a um, law enforcement network. Um, we have um, many organizations, um, around 2,000, that can access this information who do consumer protection um, um, work. And so it's not just us, it's other organizations that could bring cases and help protect the consumers. Let me just add to that just a little bit. Um, Many of the organizations that are members of the Consumer Sentinel Network are um, criminal law enforcement agencies. Um, and so when you report into Consumer Sentinel, you are not just connecting with the FTC, but with these thousands of users around the country, many of whom are criminal law enforcers. Um, we also have resources for people who are um, are, are victims of fraud, or in, in some cases, there's some information here also about identity theft, um, and consumer.gov. Um, and I point to this research particularly because just like identity theft.gov, this is tailored to be as accessible and easy to use as possible. Um, it's also available in Spanish. And the idea is for people dealing with these problems, what resources are available with information to educate them about these, these types of fraud, um, both to prevent and once it's happened to them. So um, I highly recommend this if you're, if you're helping people who have these kind of issues. So in addition, um, for, for, Consumer Sent for Consumer Sentinel, which is our, our um, database of um, consumer complaints, we have um, a link that we can provide to legal services organizations where you can enter them um, directly. Now, you would go through, um, go through the path and file the complaint on behalf of um, your client or the, or the person you're helping. And the idea is we would, if you go through this link, it, it is flagged as being from a legal services organization. So why is this helpful? Um, well, for you, um, it can help track some metrics. We can, we can, if at your request, give you information about which complaints have come in, which ones you, you've um, filed, 
um, we'll be able to um, track that from our end um, to know who we would be able to contact for more information about these complaints. I will say that um, these complaints are very helpful to us for one reason. Um, we know that the people that legal services um, help and assist are, are the same populations that under-report complaints to us. And so we really want to make sure that we're getting complaints from this population as well and want to make sure that we're getting all the information so that we know what frauds they're being targeted for and so that we can help um, um, in all of the ways that we do um, in those cases. And we particularly like complaints um, from our legal services providers because, A, you give us a lot of information. They're usually rich in information, whereas consumer complaints can sometimes be a little scant in details. Um, we also know someone to contact, someone who would have details about the, about the circumstances and also potentially have collected documents, et cetera, that would be useful um, if we're moving forward on an, an investigation. So that is helpful. Um, if you are interested or this sounds like something that would be helpful to you, um, you can get in contact with me on this slide. You'll see my name and, and my email address. Um, we have, um, for specific circumstances, if you know that what you are really dealing with, for instance, is a bunch of debt collection complaints, we can tailor that link so that it goes straight to the path for debt collection or any of the paths that we have um, so that we can make sure that it's as useful and as easy for you to use as possible. Um, and like I said, I'm happy to talk to you in detail about how that link would work and how to get you that link um, to make sure that we can um, um, help you do it and then also um, these really valuable complaints for us. We would love to have them. Um, so just to build on that a little bit, um, and we're, we're going to be closing up here in a minute, um, we do use the complaints that we get from legal services organizations. They are very valuable. Um, over the last several years, we've brought cases that have been referred by legal services organizations. Um, many of them have started with uh, simple complaints into Consumer Sentinel. Um, uh, or, so, you know, somebody picks up the phone and, you know, calls me directly or calls somebody directly. But an easy pipeline is to get these complaints filed into Sentinel. Um, some examples of some types of cases that we have brought are um, we brought a case that was referred to us um, about an immigration services scam. We brought one about a mortgage foreclosure rescue scam, and that particular scam was actually based in the Dominican Republic, and we were able to get some international assistance in getting that, that bad actor shut down. Um, we have um, brought cases about credit reporting issues. Um, we've brought cases about um, frauds affecting elderly consumers. Um, so your reports here matter. I'm just giving you a few exa uh, exemplars um, of some things that we've seen or phony debt collection types of cases. Um, we have certainly seen those and you all have been instrumental in bringing those to our attention. So we really want to encourage this. And if any of you are interested in getting a link, a link that you can put in your office. So this is not on a public facing website, but rather on, on your internal facing website. Um, where your intake uh, professionals uh, and your lawyers can, um, uh, you know, get these uh, complaints into Sentinel. This is something that we can track. You know, again, uh, Amy mentioned that when we are successful in our law enforcement cases that we do try to get money back to people. I will tell you one of the impediments to getting money back to folks is that we cannot always identify all of the victims. And when we can identify them, we, we don't always have their contact information. In the last, um, in the last few months, you know, I have um, had the, the great, uh, you know, uh, pleasure of um, hearing from legal services advocates who filed complaints on behalf of their clients and called to tell me that they had received the checks for their clients. Um, and that is really terrific because if their complaints are in Sentinel, we can find the consumer and we can, you know, we've got their contact information. We can get a check out to them if we happen to have sued that particular company and have money that we can distribute. It is a real pleasure for us when we're able to contribute that way. So again, while we're not a criminal law enforcement agency, we are a civil law enforcement agency. We do get money back. And when we can uh, get that back to uh, your clients, we're delighted to do that. 
Um, okay, um, and then the last piece of this is um, what are the types of fraud cases that um, we have seen affecting low-income populations. Um, I don't have a separate slide for you on this. Um, um, I neglected to cover it earlier when we were going through the Consumer Sentinel data book, um, and it's not broken down in the data book because we don't collect information, that kind of demographic information about um, how much money people earn. Um, but I can tell you um, what we have seen um, in our cases. So we see um, debt-related cases certainly affecting the low-income population. Debt relief um, is one big category of this. Bogus debts. Frequently, uh, debt uh, collection calls that come with um, threats, threats of imminent arrest, um, uh, for example. Um, bogus charges to bank accounts is another one that we see. Um, and this is one that I think many of you will be familiar with. Um, they frequently begin with somebody having made some kind of an application online um, that it requires them to input their bank account information. So sometimes you'll see this in the context of, you know, somebody applies for a payday loan. Well, that information can um, be sold to unscrupulous um, uh, actors who, you know, can then initiate debits onto people's bank accounts. And, you know, the harm we see there um, is, uh, is one that you'll be familiar with. Um, it's not just the initial debits, but then all of the various insufficient fund um, charges that get added on to people's accounts. Um, so those are things uh, that we see in the debt-related sphere. Um, uh, the second thing I'll mention is um, education-related, um, uh, in the education-related sphere. Um, so diploma mills, for example. Um, we have sued a number of diploma mills. Um, and um, just, um, you all probably saw the announcement of our settlement with DeVry University. Um, that certainly affected many uh, low-income students. Um, we recently sent out um, a settlement or redress checks to DeVry students. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll mention as uh, scams that really affect um, low-income folks are um, job scams. Um, these are the scams where people pay money. Sometimes they pay money for some kind of a supposed certification of some sort um, to get a job, and then there is no job. Um, or they pay money up front for some kind of an opportunity to work from home. You know, this sometimes will target folks who are elderly or folks who are um, um, uh, disabled, um, folks who can't leave uh, home for one reason or another. Um, so these are um, three big types of scams that we, we do see hitting low-income communities. Um, we do want to hear more about this. We do know that low-income communities do not report fraud at the same rates um, as others. And um, so we would really love to get your, um, your input um, and, your, um, and your, uh, your reports uh, from your communities into Sentinel. Again, if you want to get that link, please don't hesitate to contact Amy. Um, we'd, we'd love to set you up with that. Okay, um, now we're going to open up the floor for questions. Um, I've, got, um, I've got one comment. Um, uh, about uh, there being a data book, um, but advising us not to skip Washington, D.C. or Puerto Rico uh, in the statistics um, because they are heavily populated. And that's an excellent point. Um, thank you for raising that. Um, I, I know that our data book does include statistics about the District of Columbia that is separated out in our state's page, um, but not Puerto Rico, and that is something we should absolutely add. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Okay, the question is, when you said some creditors may still ask for a police report, what should we advise clients? Just use identitytheft.gov or both? So um, we do want to encourage people to use the identitytheft.gov affidavit, um, and um, only in cases where creditors absolutely will not accept anything but a police report should you have to go through this uh, step of, of getting a police report. Uh, but we do think you should be able to just use the identitytheft.gov report. You know, this is the federal government's resource for identity theft victims, um, and creditors can and should be told that. Um, the next question I have is, if we have undocumented clients, is there anything, um, is there anything, any resource we can tell them, um, I'm sorry, is there anything we can tell them 
reassure them. To reassure them that their information will not be sent to ICE, or can we not make that claim at all? Okay, uh, this is a very important question. So ICE is one of the law enforcement agencies that does have access to consumer sentinel. Um, so it's important for you to know that. You should not make the representation that filing a um, complaint uh, will not uh, result in ICE having access to it. So it's not sent to ICE, but it is available to ICE. Um, so uh, that's important for you to know. And your clients may make a decision that rather than reporting their full name uh, and address to, um, into Consumer Sentinel, that they prefer to have you um, uh, you know, file the complaint on behalf of your organization. That is perfectly fine to do. You do not have to input any information into Consumer Sentinel that you do not want uh, to be shared with other government agencies. Um, it is fine to file the complaint anonymously, um, or it is fine, it's actually even better if you can file a complaint from your organization, and if you wish to, um, if you wish to or your client wishes to not provide their name, um, that's okay too. Um, but at least then we have a person to contact about what the, you know, what the issue may have been. Um, okay, um, how do we interface with IcePen? Okay, IcePen, um, that's an interesting question. So. Um, we have, so ICEPEN is, uh, for those of you um, who don't know, is an international group um, of countries that work on consumer protection issues. Um, and um, the FTC works um, with ICEPEN quite a lot. Um, no, okay, the FTC works with ICEPEN quite a lot. Um, so foreign countries, um, the foreign countries that have access to information about consumer sentinel data, are um, Canada and Australia. They have some privileges to get um, information um, through Consumer Sentinel. Um, other than that, um, the only portal that's available to foreign governments is through, um, uh, yeah, through a piece we call eConsumer. And eConsumer, um, E-consumer uh, countries really only view complaints filed by other consumers in e-consumer countries. And I think there are 37 countries that are members of that, um, but the Consumer Sentinel Network complaints do not go, uh, do not go out to those. Um, Chris, are there any other questions? Yeah, can I just read them to you? Yes, read me the question, yes. Okay, so the question is regarding identity theft victims who have since lost everything including a permanent address. What will Will that become an issue while trying to recover from identity theft? Um, yeah, so I think that there are all kinds of um, special considerations that go with a homeless population, um, and uh, recovering from identity theft, I think, is no exception to that. Um, uh, the lack of a permanent address uh, it can make it certainly much harder for government agencies to find you and contact, contact you. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have any more expertise on how to, how to address that, that specific population. Um, they can still be correcting their credit reports. Uh, a lot of the homeless people actually do still have credit reports. If there's incorrect information on there, they can, they can start making those changes. There are steps that they can, a uh, uh, homeless uh, population can be taking to recover from identity theft. So um, thank you. Uh, that was um, Sina Gresson uh, from the FTC who is um, here uh, with us today. So um, they certainly can be continue to take steps to uh, uh, fix their credit reports at the very least. We don't have any more questions on the line at the moment. Um, Ariel, I wonder if you have anything you wanted to ask or add? Hello, um, we have nothing to add on our end. Those are really great questions and we thank everyone um, for being so engaged and bringing great questions to the floor. I was just waiting to see if we had something last minute come in, um, but it looks like we are all set. So a big thank you uh, to Monica and Amy for this great presentation today and thank you all of you for joining us. 
Um, again, we will have the presentation slides posted to the NLAGA website in the next day or so, and you can expect to have the recording on that site too in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much and have a great day, everybody.